All right, well, today uh, we are going to be looking in Psalm 139 for our scripture. It'll be on the screens, or you can uh, flip in your Bibles. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. 139, beginning in verse 13. And the word of the Lord reads, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. But Father in heaven, we pray that your word would nourish our souls today. And Lord, that you would speak through me despite all of my inadequacies and unworthiness, Lord, that I would be your instrument, that you could touch your people this morning, right where they need to be touched. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, it's still you asked for it, the time where you turn in your questions and uh, uh, Pastor Mike sorts through them and decides on which uh, uh, questions uh, he's going to preach sermons on. And so today we have a question from Linda Stonebreaker. And uh, you can uh, read on the screen or it's on your outline in your bulletin. Uh, uh, Linda says, destiny. Does everyone have a destiny in the way they leave this life? Cancer, abortion, car wreck, Alzheimer's, etc. Of course, he knows everything. Do we get what we deserve in this life if we abuse this precious gift of life? I just want to thank Linda for uh, asking such a simple question, um, <laughs> making my job so easy this morning. <laughs> so uh, I have to say, I, I struggled with this one a little bit this week. Uh, uh, just um, It's a difficult question. It's one that, that we all uh, ask ourselves, all we, we have to face, because death is very much a part of every single one of our lives, unless you are extremely young. Um, all of us have experienced the death of someone uh, who we at least know, if not close. Uh, um, and, uh, something, uh, is Don Rathburn in here? Uh, I'm not sure if Don's in this service or not. Okay, she may not be here today. Um, something that's happened in our church family here just in the past week and a half uh, is uh, um, Don's uh, good friend, uh, Kim McDowell, uh, who has started coming here about, uh, about three, three months ago. Uh, she was one of the victims in the uh, car wreck. Uh, on 28 and 52, about the 10 days ago or so. I don't know if you heard about that hit and run. Um, uh, as, as far as I know, she's still hanging on. She's down in Indianapolis at a, um, in, in the hospital, but not in, in, in very good shape. So death is, is very present to all of us. It's something that, that each one of us deals with. Um, so I, let's uh, start today by, by looking at, at the psalm that, that we read to, to see if we can glean anything from that. Um, so as we, we dive back into it, I love this, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Can you see God with his knitting needles? I mean, just in there going, oh, this is going to be great. I, I, I just love the fact, about the idea about him being so hands-on. And the, the thing that is so great is Da Vinci, uh, 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 Monet, uh, uh, Van Gogh, none of them have anything on God. And guess what? You are his masterpiece. And I think some of us in here need to hear that today because a lot of us are like, oh no, I'm ugly. This is his masterpiece. Really? Uh, You are his masterpiece. Now sometimes we make choices that disrupt his masterpiece, don't we? We eat too many donuts or we smoke or we, we do things that are harmful to ourselves. But my friends, he knitted you. He made you. And don't you forget it. God don't make no junk. All right, if you like my English there, sorry. But in any case, he has made you, and you are his masterpiece. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
The scripture says his works are wonderful. You're his work and you are wonderfully, wonderfully made. Now, what else does it say here? Uh, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Uh, Finishing down here uh, at the end of 16. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. What exactly does that mean that all his, our days were written in his book? Well, I think to really uh, uh, unpack this question, we have to have a little bit of a discussion between free will and predestination. And I promise to be done before the burger bash. Um, so so uh, as we look at it, we see different traditions in the church are going to answer Linda's question differently. Uh, we come from the Wesleyan Arminian tradition as Methodists. Uh, John Wesley's the founder of Methodism, and uh, one of the sources that he gleaned his theology from was a guy named Arminius. And, and the idea there is that, that we have free will. Now, we can't receive God until God's grace is upon us, and, and it's by his grace and through his grace that we can, can open up our hearts to receive him as Lord and Savior. But even still, we have the choice to say no. As we look in, in the Reformed tradition, uh, their uh, thinking, their uh, theology is that God's grace is irresistible. And if he pours out his grace, boom, you have no choice. You are now his. Uh, you, you can't accept it or reject it. You, you, you just are in his grace because he has, has given you his grace. Um, of course, part of the idea with, with uh, uh, free will versus destination is that if, if God has destined everything and if God is in total control, then that means that he causes everything to happen. Well, I don't know about you. I'm not real comfortable uh, saying, blaming God for shootings and abortions and for all the evil that's in this world. I think that that stuff comes from our evil choices to reject his will. Um, I, I'm, I'm not willing to, to put all that on God because uh, I don't really want to serve a God that causes sin. That's not me. And now, realize as I'm saying this, I've set up a straw man here today. You know, the the Reformed argument is a lot more complicated than that, but I'm just kind of uh, getting to the basics because we do only have a few minutes here before you all start throwing things at me. Uh, So, so, but in in general, I believe God has given us free will to to receive or reject him and and his will and his plan for our lives uh, versus uh, the idea of, of... Complete and total predestination. Well, well, think about the idea uh, when you were dating, or, or maybe some of you are dating right now. Um, the idea of if, if you could have a love potion and put that in the other person's drink when they aren't looking. And it would cause them to madly and totally forever be just ooey gooey over you for the rest of your life. <sighs> well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, at least, at least at first, because... Well, I mean, they, uh, they just are, are totally mad about you. But, but what happens is over time you would realize, you know, they're not choosing to love me for me. They're just caused to do this because of the potion that's in there. You know, uh, if, if, if God has uh, destined us and we have to have no choice but to obey him, then we're just robots. We can't really express our love for him unless there's the choice to reject him. You know, that, that's why love is risky, isn't it? Because true love can only exist if there's an option for the other person to hurt us, isn't it? I mean, uh, that's one reason why we love is because so we need to keep showing our love and keep choosing love so we don't hurt our spouse, so we don't hurt other people that we love, right? Choosing to continue to love even when we feel like hurting them, right? Continuing to choose love even when they may not even deserve it, but choosing love. Uh, as I tell my premarital counseling uh, uh, victims, um, uh, thank you. You know, it's, it's about choosing love even when you don't feel like it. Because guess what? There's going to be times in marriage when you don't feel like it. But choosing, even, even today, always continuing this day and the next day to choose to show love whether you feel like it or not. Uh, so, any case... Um, as I was, uh, um, oh, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, another part of, of kind of looking at the, the free will predestination debate, I, I kind of look at, um, at, uh, at this kind of like looking at a book. So I brought an American Methodism history book um, because I'm a nerd. But um, 
so as we, we look at this, kind of think about this book as being the history of humanity, of all time, from beginning to end, is, is right here in this book. And, and uh, God, he created time, and some may dispute this, and that's okay, uh, but I believe that since God created time, he, he can a- act outside of it. He doesn't have to be bound by it, but he can go in and out, and, and so he can take time, kind of like this book, and he can look and go, ooh, so that's the day Francis Asbury died. Oh, you know, so, um, but by reading it, myself, if I'm reading it here, uh, just because I find out, oh, this is the day uh, Francis Asbury died, me reading it in a book, did I cause it by my knowledge? No, that's ridiculous. Uh, It happened, and it's in here, and it's recorded, but my knowledge of it didn't cause it to happen. In the same way, I think that God can look at the book of, of history and look, and he memorizes every page, and he knows everything in here. But I don't believe that his knowledge of it uh, implies that he caused it. So instead, he can look here, and he can whisper back into the ears of the prophets, and they can testify about what they saw, uh, the Messiah coming, and, and about things to come. And, and so um, that, that's how I kind of look at it, is, is sort of like that. So hopefully that's a helpful illustration. If not, forget it. So... So in any case, as I was looking at this and and, uh, studying it, another scripture came to my mind. And it doesn't exactly go off the topic, but for me, it it, it felt like the the heart of the question was was very close. Um, So the disciples, you see, they asked Jesus a similar question there in John uh, chapter 9. And what did the disciples ask him? Well, we look uh, in John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, and uh, it says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, to understand this, you really need to get the cultural context of the day. You see, at that time, uh, the belief of the Jews, what was common for them, was the thought that if you are rich... It's because God has blessed you, because you must be a really good person. If you are poor, you must be a no-good scoundrel, because God's cursing you. If you have great health, well, you must be a really good, faithful believer in God, because he's blessed you with good health. If you are sick, well, it's because you've sinned, and because he's cursing you, because of something that you have done. That was the way that they thought back then. And, and so that is the cultural context in which we see this, uh, this statement, and so... Uh, so the disciples, um, now I don't know if it's out of curiosity after, if they're just like, well, well, Jesus, we've been wondering this. How does this happen? Or if they're like, oh, hey, let's impress Jesus with this question. You know, we've been listening to the Pharisees and, and, and we've been figuring out some nice questions now. So we're going to ask them this one. Uh, um, so I'm not sure what, what they, their motivation was, but they asked, why, why Jesus, or, or who, who sinned? Did this man sin? I'm sorry. Am I being too loud? Okay. Did, did, did this man sin or his parents sin? That he made him blind. And Jesus goes, neither. And the disciples go, say, what? What do you mean? Somebody had to sin for, for this to happen. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. It's, life isn't cause and effect necessarily. Sometimes there definitely is. Sometimes there is sin that has actual consequences, and we can see the cause and effect relationship. But sometimes there is not a cause and effect relationship. Sometimes we just get cancer. Sometimes we just have arthritis. Sometimes we just have a bad day. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily because uh, of our actions. Sometimes we do things that do cause things. You know, if we smoke for 50 years, guess what? And get lung cancer. I, I, I feel sorry for you, but that's a consequence. You know, if uh, 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 I, I am unloving to my wife, guess what? She might ask for a divorce. There are consequences uh, to my actions sometimes. So, but what, uh, what do we see here? Jesus <laughs> just says, no, no, no. Uh, the, the, the fact that he was born blind was not because of sin. It's just because of the way that this life is. It's a, a, a but. Something uh, that he did say to them, guess what? God can use this circumstance that is unfortunate to bring about his glory. And my friends, that's exactly what he wants in each one of our lives. Because sometimes life doesn't go the way we plan. And what does God want? God wants for us, instead of having our pity party, right? 
I'm good at having pity parties. I really am. But instead of us doing that, God wants to use our tears to bring him glory. He wants us to be able to to use the temptation that we struggle with to be able to share with others how God has given us deliverance. He wants us to be able to use how we went through grief to help others that are grieving to find hope in him. He wants us to be able to to, uh, talk about how we went through struggles in our marriage and help other couples to uh, make it through because uh, we are able to share how God is faithful and how he was faithful with us and will be faithful with them. God wants to use every tear that we've shed to glorify him. And so this man was blind, but guess what? God had plans for it. He said, hey, I may not have caused your blindness, but I'm going to use it to bring me glory by healing you. And so... um, any case, so but we see um, you know, the, the, something that's implied in, in the scripture is that life, things in life aren't supposed to, aren't as they su- are supposed to be. Things in this life are not as they are supposed to be. How are things supposed to be? Well, they're supposed to be perfect. We're supposed to be in Eden still. Y'all remember that, that uh, Garden of Eden way back in Genesis chapter 2? Uh, that wonderful place that God made, a beautiful garden. I, I bet there was a donut tree in Eden. I really do. I mean, I, I can't imagine all the amazing stuff that was there. Just You walk by anything, and, and you, oh, it sounds like heaven to me, let me tell you. Yeah, I mean, this is an amazing place. And God told Adam and Eve, I give you authority over this place. You are to tend this garden. I give you authority over the animals. Uh, uh, you are in control. Uh, just do this one thing. Don't eat from this one tree. Don't, don't touch that fruit. Look, at all, as far as you can see, yummy, yummy donut trees everywhere. <laughs> just don't eat from this one. I don't care if it says Mary Lou's. Don't eat from this one. So, and everything else will be okay. What did they do? They went to Mary Lou's, right? So, they ate, ate from the one, one fruit of the, the tree that they were not supposed to. And because they had authority, uh, God had given them authority over creation. He'd given them authority over the garden. Everything twisted. Everything was affected by the sin. Let, let's look here in Romans chapter 8. Sorry, Emmeline, I wasn't very entertaining. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 19. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjugated to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So we see here what Adam and Eve did in the garden, it twisted Uh, creation. And so creation is no longer the way it is supposed to be. Because of Adam and Eve's original sin in the garden, there are tornadoes, there are earthquakes, and hurricanes, and spiders, and mosquitoes. And, uh, well, yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe in Eden, they had smiley faces, and they were, I don't know. In any case. Oh, all right. So, But in any case, we see that that creation is longing to be restored. It's longing to to be restored. And you know what? We have that same longing in our heart. Why? Because we know this is not the way life is supposed to be. Life isn't supposed to be affected by sin like it is, but it is. Why? Because either because of Adam and Eve's first choice or the choices that we make. Like a drunk driver coming and killing people. That choice was not the fault of the victim, was it? It was the the drunk driver's choice. And all of us make choices, don't we? To be mean to our co-worker or to be nice to them. To show love to our wife or withhold that love. We make choices each and every day. And they affect the way that everybody else lives, don't they? They affect how they feel love, how they see God. So something else that this might blow your mind, and, and this may not be true. This is my thought. This is my belief. I believe that death isn't even supposed to happen. We're not supposed to have to experience death. Why? Because in in the garden, what did God say? He said, don't eat from the fruit or you will surely die. 
it wasn't immediate. Their spiritual death was immediate. But then what happened? Well, they began the process of aging and the process of dying. I believe if they hadn't have eaten of the fruit in the garden, if sin had never entered in, there would have been no death. We would all still be in Eden. And Adam and Eve, we can go say, hey, great, 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 because death would not have come and we would just be living in this wonderful, amazing place. And so I think that's one reason death hurts so much. Because it's not supposed to be. It's not supposed to be. And so it hurts and we grieve and we mourn because it's not supposed to be here. But I'm thankful that there's a place coming where there will no longer be any tears or death. So... But my friends, we're not there yet. We're still in this earth that's fallen and we're in a a world where death does exist. And so my question to you is, where are you going to spend eternity? Because you see, even though death has entered in, we still are eternal beings. Because that didn't change with the fall. We are still eternal. Eternal beings, just as Adam and Eve were, we still are. Our our eternity, it, it it may be weird to think about, you're never going to die. You're going to live forever, somewhere. So after death, though, there's only two options. There are only two places of residence. You know, you, you can look up uh, uh, um, real estate and you know, oh, there's this neighborhood, there's this school district. No, no, that's not how it is after death. You're, there's either heaven or hell. And those are the only two options. And you might be thinking, well, what, how, how do I get to one versus the other? Well, guess what? It's not the works that you do. It's not about how good you are. Because what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. So that means if we have ever committed one single sin in our entire life, we have earned a death penalty. Is there anybody in here who hasn't lied at least once? Or uh, who hasn't ever done anything that was sinful at all or had a bad thought or a mean thought? Oh, we're in sorry shape, aren't we? Every single one of us has earned the right to the death penalty, and to spend all eternity in hell. Isn't that wonderful? That is what we have earned. But thanks be to God, he hasn't left us there. Because there is another option. And so here's the question. How is, uh, what is the determining factor to get to heaven then? Because that's an important thing. If we're all hell bound, it's very good to know how can we get to heaven. That's an important question. So, well, what is the only determining factor? All right, you have to do this many Hail Marys. and No, that's not it. Um, how, how, what is the determining factor? Look in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you do a whole lot of really good things... No, that's not what it says. Romans 10, verse 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I didn't have anything to do with that sentence, did I? It's all about Jesus. So what do we do? We have to declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. Then we will be saved. It's not by uh, teaching Sunday school for 20 years. It's not about uh, leading 15 people to the Lord or meeting some kind of quota of how many times you come to the food truck. All those are good things. All those are wonderful things, but the only thing that will save us, the only way for us to get to heaven is for us to declare uh, with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. That's the ticket. That is the only determining factor right there. Now, after we do declare that he is Lord, well, what does that mean? If we have declared him to be Lord, that means we have to be obedient then, don't we? If he's our Lord, we have to listen to him. And so what do we need? Our lives need to change, and not because he's a mean taskmaster, but we should say thank you because you have saved us. Thank you for uh, not having me go to hell, but instead giving me peace and joy. Thank you. And our lives should be one great big thank you to Jesus. That's how life should be after we receive him as our Lord and our Savior. And so my question to you today is, do you know where you would spend eternity if you died today? If you have a heart attack because you came to the burger bash, what... I'm sorry. I'm going to eat a burger, I promise. So, uh, but if you don't make it tonight... 
Where would you spend eternity? Do you know that? Could you answer that? Do you know beyond a shadow of doubt that you can say, I am his, not because of my works, but because of his grace? If not, you need to make sure you take care of that before you leave here today. You need to make sure that you know that your destination is heaven with Jesus and not hell with Satan and his angels. All right. Kind of coming back to the question a little bit. We've kind of strayed a little bit. I would say that even though I believe that there's free will and God hasn't necessarily destined uh, uh, the way that we die, I believe that there was one death that he did destine exactly. And that was Jesus' death on the cross. Um, How do I I know this? Well, as we look at Scripture, we see hundreds and hundreds of years before Scripture talks to us about the cross. And the amazing thing is, as we look in history, this is hundreds of years before crucifixion has even been invented. And so these things that they're talking about could only have been uh, put in the the minds of of David and Isaiah if uh, God was over here. And he turned back and he whispered into their ears, hey, I want you to write this down. And for them to know and be able to, to prophesy to us and, and tell us about the Messiah who was coming. And so, so we look in, in Psalm 22, a couple selections. Uh, Psalm chapter 22, uh, verses 7 and 8 read, All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. If you've read the gospel accounts, that's almost a direct quote of something that's going to happen hundreds and hundreds of years later of the mockers at the foot of the cross. Let's continue uh, down to verse 15 and following. It says, My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now, how can someone 400, 500, 600 years before crucifixion is invented talk about piercing hands and feet? And did you hear the last part? What were they doing at the foot of the cross? Remember the Roman soldiers, they were gambling to see who would get Jesus' clothes. They predicted it hundreds of years beforehand. God had the picture, and he was able to whisper into the ears of David for him to to see the picture and write it down. And we look over to Isaiah, beginning in chapter uh, 53, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. We considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced, here again, crucifixion, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. My goodness gracious, there's so much truth here. But there's also evidence that, yep, indeed, God did plan Jesus' death to happen. And yet... Even so, Jesus still had a choice. He still had a choice and was in complete control. He could have said no. Did you know that? Jesus could have said no. Now, we would all be in a lot of sorry shape if he did. So I'm very thankful he said yes, but he could have said no. Let's, uh, uh, what am I basing this on? I'm basing this on John chapter 10, uh, beginning uh, 17 and 18. Um, I actually did this Thursday in my Bible study. Just happened to correspond here. It's kind of kind of neat how God did that. Uh, John chapter ten, verse seventeen. The word reads: "The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again." See that? Uh, what's the basis of the relationship? Is obedience. How do we show God that we love Him? Obedience. Same thing. 
All right, so continue on, 18. It says, no one takes it from me. You hear that? No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I received from my Father. Jesus is in control. As you look through John and some of the other gospel accounts, there's times that Jesus makes the religious people so mad that they want to kill him. Literally. Not just be mad at him, but they're looking, where's a rock? i got to throw something at this guy. I mean, they are so mad at Jesus, they're ready to kill him. But time and time again, he just walks right through them. If you are so mad you want to kill somebody, you think you're going to let them walk right by you? No. But Jesus is in control here. He's hasn't, he hasn't laid down his life yet, and so they can't get him. And so it's not until Judas comes and gives him the kiss that he lays down his life. He says, I will be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because, Lord, I know this is the plan for them to come. This is the only way for them to receive salvation, the only way that we can spend eternity with all of our children So he laid down his life for you and for me. Praise be to his holy name. But it doesn't end there or we would be in a lot of trouble. You see, it wasn't just that he had to take the punishment, but he rose himself from the grave. He took his life back up again. And because he did that, he conquered sin and he conquered death. And we too can conquer death and sin by allowing him to be the Lord of our lives and receiving him into our hearts. And so we no longer have to live the way that we used to live. We no longer have to be the slaves to sin. And we no longer have to be in fear of death and of hell because we have heaven and the promise of eternity in Christ Jesus. The praise be to his name, to his holy name, forever and ever. Amen. And amen. Oh. Well, how do we sum all this up? Well, again, to my Reformed brothers and sisters, I apologize. I disagree with them. I've come to the conclusion that I don't think that God has destined our, our death. He knows about it. He knows the moment. He knows how it's going to happen. Thankfully, he hadn't told me. I think that would be a little nerve-wracking. But... I do know that, he, I, and I believe with all my heart that he, knowing what he does, can be preparing us the way that we need it. If we're seeking him, again, if we're going our own way, how can he help us? But if we're following him, if we're being obedient to him, he can put the people around us that we need for support in the time of our death. He can put the people around our family that they need in the time of support when we die, and they, they need support. Because they're grieving. And so he can set up the situation so that we can be taken care of. Isn't that amazing? He wants to provide for every single part of us, even in the way we die. Isn't he good? Isn't he incredible and amazing? So I don't believe that he destines it. But he's there to help us and bless our journey into eternity. And so for me, the more important question for us to end with today is is for us to, to live like this. Are we living like this? My prayer is that may we live as those who are prepared to die. May we live as those who are prepared to die. And when our time comes, may we die as those who are prepared to live. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we pray for you to be with us as we shrink before the mystery of death. Lord, it it is is scary. It's overwhelming at times and it's, it's painful as we think about loved ones who have gone on. Father, but we are so thankful that you didn't leave us in sorry shape. You didn't leave us to just be uh, just here wandering around with no hope. But you have come that we may have hope in Jesus Christ. We thank you that he chose to lay down his life and to pick it up again that we may have life and have it more abundantly. So Lord, we, we need you today. 
Help us, Father, to live as those who are prepared to die and to die as those prepared to go on to live forever with you in heaven. Lord, we pray that we would be faithful stewards of all you have given us. That the world that does not have hope can have hope because we are being obedient to you. Use us, we pray, dear Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now, my friends, if there's anyone here that you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, if you don't have a secure destiny just yet, you're not sure, you can't answer that question, yes, I'll be in heaven. My friends, don't leave this place without making sure that you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you are His. And He is yours. If you want to make that decision, you can come and tell me as I'm standing uh, at the end uh, out by the back door. Tell your friend. Tell the person you came with. This altar is always open. If there's something you need to pray about, either this or another issue, you can come and pray as we say our closing song. But the thing is, don't leave today until you have taken care of all your business with God. Let's stand and